Welcome to this lecture. Let me introduce our panelists. Professor William Shabas is a professor of international law at Middle Essex University in London. Uh, he is also emeritus professor at the Leiden University and the University of uh, Galloway. He is honorary chairman of the Irish Center for Human Rights and invited visiting scholar at the Paris School of International Affairs. He has uh, appeared as consul before several international and national courts and tribunals, including the International Cor Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, and the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights, and the Supreme Court of Canada. William Shabas is uh, author of multiple books and articles devoted to the uh, international human rights law and international criminal law. Uh, his speech and talk will be commented by Professor Karolina Wierczyńska, uh, who is Associate Professor of Public International Law at the Institute of Law Studies at the Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, where she is Vice President of the Committee on Legal Sciences uh, and Head of Research Center on International Criminal Law. Uh, she was a member of the International Law Association's Committee on Complementarity in International Law uh, her research focus um, lies in international public law, international criminal law, and human rights. She is, she is as well author of multiple books and scientific art articles devoted to uh, these issues. William, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, for coming to Berlin, and now the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give this lecture at this conference. And I have to apologize. I had, uh, when you approached me and invited me, as you know, I already had a commitment to do a conference on this sub on international criminal law generally in Paris tomorrow and Friday. And so I'm going to have to leave tonight and won't be able to hear the what looked like uh, two more days or a day and a half of fascinating presentations. Uh, I want to start my remarks with a little bit of history because it's, to me it's, a very, it's very striking the, the connections that Ukraine has with the development of international criminal law. Um, important things that, and connections between Ukraine that perhaps are not that relevant to today's conflict but they're, they're, they're important to be reminded of and to, to point out. Um, during the Second World War, it said that the first war crimes trial uh, took place in Ukraine. Uh, this was the Kharkiv trial. I don't know if it was entirely the first. The Soviets held a trial some months before in uh, Krasnodarsk, which is not in Ukraine. But in, uh, the trial in Kharkiv was an important one. Michael Basler, in his great book about forgotten trials of the Holocaust, says that it's the first trial of the Holocaust. And uh, there were four accused, three uh, German officers and a, a collaborator. Um, the trial lasted for two or three days in December of 1943 and ended with death sentences for the four of them. And they were hanged publicly in the main square in Kharkiv um, before a crowd of 30 or 40,000 people. The trial was also important because uh, it, dealt, it dealt with uh, both domestic criminal law, but also with international law. So this made it also quite, really, unique. One of the first trials after the famous Leipzig trials at the end of the First World War to use international law as part of the prosecution. One of the other connections, of course, are the two great personalities that we know of. Uh, one who's been mentioned frequently already today, Raphael Lemkin, and the other, Hirsch Lauterpacht. Uh, Lauterpacht, who came from uh, a town not far from Lviv. Uh, yes, north, uh, I think about 60 kilometers or so north of Lviv. And um, my ancestors came from just to the uh, east of Lviv. Uh, my father's parents were born there. And, um, and Lemkin, who was from further north, but they both ended up studying just after the First World War at the university in uh, Lviv. Uh, and uh, they, of course, went on to make huge contributions, Lemkin, to the development of the notion of the crime of genocide, which is 
the first part of his great career, but then also to the campaigning part of it. First of all, campaigning for the resolution of the General Assembly in 1946 that recognized genocide as a crime under international law, then participating in the drafting of the convention, which was adopted in 1948, and then uh, as an activist, really, uh, trying to see that the convention entered into force and that it achieved more and more ratifications. Louder Pact, um, well, many of you know the book by Philippe Sands. Uh, Philippe is, uh, is probably more partial to Louder Pact than to Lemkin. Um, I think Louder Pact was probably a more pleasant personality than Lemkin. But uh, I think that Louder Pact's significance is perhaps over, is exaggerated slightly. He definitely proposed the term crimes against humanity for the charter of the International Military Tribunal, but he was really uh, very much on the periphery of the debates, whereas Lemkin was much more, much closer to the center. And then finally, the two great Ukrainians of the Soviet team at Nuremberg, uh, Roman Rudenko, who was the Soviet, the chief prosecutor um, uh, for the Soviet Union, and Iona Nikechenko, who was the Soviet, the first, the main judge for the, for the Soviet Union. And uh, they both uh, went on after the war to have careers in, in, in Ukraine. And I think Rudenko was also involved in prosecuting um, Lavrenti Beria uh, after Stalin died. Um, and someone said that, uh, I, I think earlier today, that there was impunity for all of the uh, crime, the terrorist crimes that were committed under the Soviet Union. But Beria was judged and convicted, perhaps for treason, maybe not for the trials themselves. And of course, he was, he was executed. And I, I inquired about them when I lectured in Lviv uh, some years ago to see if I could learn more about them. And particularly Nikitchenko, he was, he's also fascinated me because uh, of his dissenting opinion in the final judgment of the tribunal, uh, which doesn't refer at all to the Katyn, um, the Katyn uh, atrocity. And uh, this is very striking because it was an important part of the prosecution. Uh, the Soviet prosecution team insisted on presenting the lie of Katyn, and uh, Nikitschenko was entirely silent. And I had hoped to learn, to get some more insight into it in the famous, uh, the, the recent book by Francine Hirsch uh, about the Soviet judgment at Nuremberg, but she, hasn't, uh, she wasn't able to unravel that mystery either. Some of you may know that I had the, the great honor of acting as counsel to Poland in the, in the Janowicz case before the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights, which dealt with the Katyn uh, massacre. And my recollection is that some of it, although the worst of it was in Katyn, that there were other massacres on a somewhat smaller scale, some of them in Ukraine, um, that took place. Well, the conference is, refers to the war of aggression, and then it talks about challenging and documenting the prosecution of war crimes. I think we're using the term war crimes in the broad meaning. There are two sort of meanings of war crimes. If we look at the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, we have an article on war crimes, Article 8, that deals with violations of the laws and customs of war, of the conventions, the Geneva Conventions, the protocols a little bit, and also, they haven't been mentioned, but they're very important, are the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907. Um, but we use the term in a broader sense as well to refer to this body of law generally. And people talk about the International Criminal Court uh, prosecuting war crimes, and they don't bother going into the details of saying, and by the way, they also prosecute genocide crimes against humanity and the crime of aggression. And, and I take it in that sense. I have some things to say about, about all of those categories. I should say, perhaps not much about crimes against humanity. I think of crimes against humanity mainly as being a category of crime that, that we use to deal with atrocities committed by a state against its own people. That was the origin of it. Um, prosecutors, of course, sometimes, and it's the case today, have a choice between prosecuting crimes against humanity and war crimes. but. Crimes against humanity are harder to prove because you have to prove that there was a widespread or systematic attack. 
You have to prove that there's a policy of a state or an organization. Whereas for war crimes, uh, it's, it's more straightforward. And if I were a practical prosecutor, I would think uh, that the place to invest the energy is in developing the evidence of war crimes rather than crimes against humanity. The consequences, at least in the law of the International Criminal Court, are the same. The penalty is the same. So um, I, I have less to say about crimes against humanity, but it's certainly perhaps an, an area that's of interest to, to the prosecutor. But first, let, let's, let's begin with genocide, the crime of crimes, as it said. And this is on the agenda, if only because both sides in the conflict uh, have accused the other of committing genocide. Uh, Putin has been talking about genocide for some time. I understand there have even been prosecutions under universal jurisdiction for genocide inside Russia. Um, and uh, on the other side, of course, uh, not only have, has Ukraine or Ukrainian representatives, including the president, uh, referred to genocide being committed, but that's also been picked up by representatives of other countries, um, parliaments and so on, uh, including the president of the United States, uh, Joe Biden, who made a kind of an offhand comment about genocide back in April. And uh, he, he did it, the, there was a Soviet official, a Russian official who did much the same thing. He said, well, it looks like genocide to me, but you know, I'm not really a specialist. We'll let the lawyers sort that out. And uh, the lawyers who sorted it out, I looked, I, I, to my knowledge, no senior uh, lawyer in the, America, in the administration of the United States has sort of developed that. I think Beth Van Skak, who's the ambassador for war crimes, testified before a congressional committee and said, was asked about it, and she said, yes, the, that's what the president said. She didn't say, and I wholeheartedly endorse it. She said, well, uh, we're looking at that, but it, it was a more carefully worded uh, discussion of it. Um, my own opinion is that while one can make out, uh, one can find elements of the evidence that you would need to establish genocide um, by Russia in Ukraine, that it's not, um, that more is needed to satisfy the standards that are expected by the major international tribunals. I'm talking about the World Court, the International Court of Justice, and where the cases have been decided, that court no longer exists, but its decisions are prestigious, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. They are dealing with a narrow definition of the crime that comes from the convention, and they're dealing with even narrow interpretations of the crime that have been developed by the international tribunals. So something that is very hard to prove. Are there elements? Sure. But is there enough to win a judicial battle in a criminal trial or a trial based on state responsibility? I think more work has to be done on this at that point. One of the things about genocide that's kind of interesting is that there are, it's, it's a bit like the expression war crimes. It's as if there are two meanings. There's a meaning, there's a narrow international law meaning that we get from the convention and from its uh, reflection in texts like Article 6 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. It's the same definition. And then there's a broader notion of it, and that's probably what the President of the United States was using. And, you know, that's fine. I have no personal objection to people using words with different meanings in a different sense. But if we're talking about documenting and prosecuting the crime of genocide, I think it's an uphill hill battle here. The other facet of the genocide discussion, of course, is the case that's been filed by Ukraine against Russia at the World Court, at the International Court of Justice. Not for genocide. I think that if, by the way, the lawyers in Moscow or in Kyiv thought there was a strong case that the other side had committed genocide, they'd be at the International Court of Justice charging it, and they're not. That might change, but, but so far, a year, almost a year has gone by, and that step has not been taken. But, as I'm sure most of you are aware, at the end of February last year, 
uh, Ukraine filed this amazing application to the International Court of Justice. I can't imagine that the lawyers did that in 24 hours, but it seems that somebody had the brilliant idea and then prepared all the materials. And I'm suspicious. My thinking is that maybe someone was working on this months before, but I have no evidence of that. This is a charge that, that Russia has violated the Genocide Convention by making a false allegation of genocide uh, that was then used to justify uh, the invasion. Um, and it raises first, well, there's sort of two questions that underpin this. First of all, can you actually sue on the basis of a convention saying that somebody has made a false allegation under the convention rather than an allegation? That's a very unusual proposition. I don't think there's much in the way of precedent or authority, but it's moving ahead, and we'll see what the judges at the court do with it. The other part of that is whether, in fact, even if the allegation is well-founded, I'm not saying that it is. We all agree it isn't. But even if it was, could that then justify the use of force to prevent genocide? Um, the United Nations Charter, which is the basis of our conversations about the crime of aggression, says that you cannot use force to settle international disputes except when authorized by the United Nations Security Council. And that's obviously not the case here. In the litigation at the International Court of Justice, we're now still at a very preliminary stage. But when there's a case involving a treaty, the International Court of Justice has now heard almost had almost 200 cases, and many of them have involved the interpretation of a treaty. There's a rule that the registrar of the court sends out a notification to every other state that's a party to the treaty, but that has no involvement in the litigation, inviting them to intervene because they have an interest in the eventual interpretation of the convention. And I guess the files of, of foreign ministries must be full of these notifications that are pretty systematically ignored. There's not really much of a practice of states doing this, but it's quite extraordinary. In the current case that Ukraine has filed against Russia, we have more than 30 states that have sent in the notices. The court set a deadline of 15th of December. I think Liechtenstein was the last one to get their, their, their statement in, but the United States did one, the United Kingdom did them. Most European states, if not all of them, managed to get in a notification. Liechtenstein got it in. I don't think Andorra did one, but, but most of them did. Um, they are all supportive of the, the issue of whether you can litigate an allegation that it's a false claim. They all support that, and that's going to be considered by the court, I think, in the admissibility stage, which is now underway. But then some of them, not all of them, address this issue of whether you can use f force outside the framework of the Charter of the United Nations because you think that someone else is committing genocide. And that's an argument, by the way, that has mainly been developed by the United States over the years. Kosovo? Kosovo, somewhat. Uh, and then in debates about, uh, about the aggression amendments to the Rome Statute. I was at the co conference in Kampala when the representatives of the United States government said that there should be an understanding that uh, acts that would otherwise be considered genocide should not be the crime of genocide if they were done to prevent the crime of genocide taking place. So, in the statements that states have submitted, they don't agree. These are all, they all agree that the case is admissible, but they don't agree on this point about uh, whether or not you can use force because you think genocide is being committed. Some of them say you can, but you have to make a good faith assessment of genocide. A good faith is presumably one taken by an analysis by the British or the French or the Americans, but not by the Russians. So we could make a list of countries who we would just say, you can't be in good faith and others who are in good faith. It's not a very workable proposition. But it's a fascinating question. Um, 
the United States uh, submission, by the way, is totally silent on this point. And I think that the United States must be concerned that, that the judges could rule on this question. I think they would rather that they don't. And they may say they don't have to. But, and the British are much the same. They say, you don't really need to go there. You don't really need to do this. So there are other things. I mean, this is, uh, aside from the issues of accountability, there's, there's law being made. Uh, all of this conflict, this war, is resulting in new law being made, or not, depending on the, on the circumstances, and also uh, about recognition that there are shortcomings in the existing law, that the existing law isn't as good as it should be, and this may precipitate moves to change it either judicially by, by activist judges who advance the law, as sometimes happened, as happened in Yugoslavia, for example, um, or by calls for new treaties. That was, we had references in this morning's uh, talk about the two protocols that were adopted to update the Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Conventions were adopted to update the law after the Second World War, and the protocols were adopted in light of some of the anti-colonial wars and the war in Vietnam. And maybe it's time to do another revision of the law. So let me turn to the next category, uh, which is war crimes. So war crimes, we can, I, I always try to think of war crimes as having sort of two basic categories, two, a way to divide war crimes into two sort of, um, yeah, two, two, two schools, if you want. One of them are what we sometimes call battlefield offenses. That is, the actual conflict, the weapons, the targeting, and all of that. And the other is the treatment of mainly of civilians, although we've had reference to, to prisoners. Uh, I would like to know more about the allegations of abuse of prisoners because in general, prisoners, there's a reciprocity to the treatment of prisoners and states are quite careful, if they can be, to treat prisoners properly because if they don't, there's a danger that their own prisoners won't be treated won't be treated well uh, either. And the, the people who know the most about the treatment of prisoners are the International Committee of the Red Cross, and they don't talk. Um, we understand why, it's entirely proper, but it, it remains a mystery. It's not the same, of course, with the battlefield offenses, and it's not the same also with civilians in territories that have been occupied, of which I think the most notorious is Bucha. Um, some of the other territories that were occupied briefly and then were retaken. And that's when the atrocities that were committed there came to light. So one of the, 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 the issues involved in prosecuting war crimes, of course, is that we, we think we're dealing, we inherit a body of law, not just the texts of the treaties, but also the way uh, they have been interpreted. And we're dealing with some unfortunate precedents that were set by the Yugoslavia Tribunal, I think, uh, that are actually going to make it, are going to make it harder to prosecute the war crimes. Um, in particular, one that, that related to uh, a campaign at the very end of the war in the former Yugoslavia in what was called Operation Storm, when the Croatian forces retook a part of Kraina, Ukraine, borderlands, uh, in the south of, of Croatia. And there was terrible shelling and bombing of, uh, of, uh, of towns, of, of, uh, of population centers. And the generals who ordered it, it was all done by artillery, were convicted at trial by a, by a unanimous judgment. But they were, that, those judgments were reversed on appeal, uh, and they were acquitted. And uh, they were acquitted, and it was, was all understood. They were influenced by concerns that had been raised by legal officers from major countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, Israel, who were concerned that judges would tie the hands of generals. And this is one of the 
things about prosecuting war crimes that, on the one hand, uh, opens the door to interesting possibilities. If you have a diplomatic conference to revise the laws of war, you're going to get a bunch of generals there with, you know, epaulets and gold braid and everything, and they don't want it to get out of hand because they want the law. They want to make sure that they keep their hands free to win wars and fight wars and so on. But when you get three judges, some of whom may have been university professors, human rights activists, whatever, who come and they make the law, the likelihood is that it, it, may, it may improve, and that may happen here. But we have these difficulties. I encountered this myself some years ago when I was on a commission of inquiry, a fact-finding commission set up by the United Nations to deal with the conflict in Gaza. And it was much the same problem, the shelling, the bombing, and so on, and the terrible casualties that result, and then only to hear the perpetrators of them turn around and say, that's how we win the war. We have to shell, uh, we, have to, we have to attack those cities, and that's because the combatants are there in the cities. Personally, I'd like to see come out of all of this a new rule of international humanitarian law that prohibits bombing and shelling of major urban centers. But this is a bit of a, a, bit of a dream uh, of someone who's a, more of a human rights activist than an than a international human, humanitarian law lawyer. The, the other part about war crimes, of course, is that it is likely to be the focus of the work of the International Criminal Court. Uh, and it's already, of course, been underway, the investigations, and we've heard a little bit about it and we'll hear more, uh, the investigations of war crimes with a view to domestic prosecutions. I'm very happy to see that work progress, and my own very modest contribution to this over the last 11 months, 10 months, has been to participate uh, in um, seminars for judges in Ukraine and to contribute also to uh, the work of the prosecutor general. You know that within a few days of the uh, outbreak of the conflict, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court made an appeal to member states of the court to trigger the jurisdiction of the court. Um, he didn't need for that to happen. He said, I can go ahead with an investigation, but first I would have to get the permission of the judges, of three judges. That's provided for in the procedure of the court. And he said, that would take some time and I want to get started right away. So almost immediately, I think more than 40 states mainly, again, the European states, members of the court, submitted these uh, um, statements uh, triggering the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. I think his explanation that he needed this to speed things up was part of the, part of the situation. But there was another part that he didn't, he didn't mention, but it may have all, also have crossed his mind. If he had to go before the three judges to convince them to let him open an investigation, he would have to convince them that the courts of Ukraine were unwilling or unable to prosecute, because that's the rule at the International Criminal Court. It's a subsidiary court. It only operates when the courts of the country that should ordinarily exercise jurisdiction fail to do so. Who would want to go and argue before three judges that the courts of Ukraine are, are inefficient, un, unfair, incapable of prosecuting. They're not. They're perfectly good courts. They get their wrists slapped, like many countries do, by the European Court of Human Rights, but they're subject to the, they're subject to the European Convention on Human Rights. They obey, more or less, like most other countries, the rulings of the European Court of Human Rights. They're perfectly capable of doing it, and they showed it, having one trial Already, maybe more will be in the works. I welcome this. I think it's great. I dare say that the International Criminal Court, if they were to take a case, it would take six or seven years to finish. That's about their track record. So I think that Ukraine is also going to be much more efficient. So I'm very much in favor of investing in the domestic legal system. I think it would have been preferable, in my own view, that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court said, 
We're here to help you. You do it. You don't need me. You do it. We're here to help you. We'll help you raise, get the resources, get the expertise. You should be prosecuting these cases and not the International Criminal Court. But it went over very well internationally with many countries who came up with voluntary contributions to the International Criminal Court, and the prosecutor has really refocused his attention. This is, I suppose, welcomed in Ukraine and by its friends and supporters. And it's not opposed by other, other constituencies that are interested in the work of the International Criminal Court, but some of them are quite discouraged because the result is that their situations are being neglected. Um, I have uh, friends in, in, who work in human rights area in Palestine, and I remember meeting them about 15 months ago in late 2021 um, in The Hague. We were there. We bumped into each other by chance. They had just had a meeting with the prosecutor or with the people in the office of the prosecutor, and they said, it's going great. They were, it was like they were, they were ecstatic. They said, for years and years, we've been trying to push this forward so that some of the violations of which we're victims will be addressed by the International Criminal Court. They said, this will be a very desirable development. And they were, they were enthusiastic. I, I was more cautious. I said, let's wait and see how this plays out because it's a new prosecutor. He took office in June of 2021. And I said, it's not clear where his focus will be. Well, I heard one of them, I can say this because it was public. He did it at a, it was a, 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 a Zoomed conference that took place in The Hague in December during the recent meeting of the Assembly of States Parties. It was a, a session that was actually sponsored by the, the Al Jazeera television station because they want the prosecutor to invest, investigate the murder of Shireen Abu Alka when she was killed uh, last year. And uh, so they were trying to promote that and this fellow who, who I had met, as I say, 15 months before and who was so keen, he stood up and took the floor and he said, we're really discouraged. He said, our case has not moved forward one millimeter in the last year. So I think this is something we have to bear in mind as well. I, I, this may be an unpopular thought here because everyone would like to see the energies of the entire world focused on the conflict in, in the former, in, in, in Ukraine. But we have to bear in mind that there are other conflicts and there are other places that cry out for attention and that shouldn't suffer. It will only have as a consequence, I think, at the International Criminal Court that while it may build enthusiasm in this part of the world, it will kill the court elsewhere. So that's my concern, is that this is going to be uh, one of the unhappy side effects or consequences of all of this. Let me um, now move to the, to the big issue, the, maybe the most interesting and the most important one is the, the crime of aggression. Uh, I have sort of three thoughts about the crime of aggression that I'd like to explore briefly in these remarks. The first one uh, is, is not focused on international criminal law, but on international human rights law. And we've already had some references to the possible contributions of bodies like the European Court of Human Rights. There's something that's cooking in international human rights law that's very interesting and is very relevant to the charge of aggression uh, by Russia against Ukraine. The um, human rights institutions and communities are starting to look at aggressive war as a violation of fundamental human rights. And, and that has been more or less off limits for many, many years. Uh, the Human Rights Council, the main human rights body, uh, political body, subordinate to the General Assembly in the United Nations, has, until recently, never made a statement about aggression. The idea being that that's not a matter for that council. It's a matter for the other council. And we've heard a bit about the other council. Uh, earlier today as well, the Security Council, that that's a monopoly of the Security Council and that human rights issues 
don't intrude on that issue that belongs to the Security Council. But at the beginning of March of 2022, in its first resolution dealing with the situation in Ukraine, the Human Rights Council talked about the war of aggression. I believe it's the first time that we've ever had that, either from the Human Rights Council or from its predecessor, the Commission on Human Rights, which was replaced by the Human Rights Council in 2006. There's another body in the, in the United Nations where we see this similar related development, and that's the Human Rights Committee. The Human Rights Committee is the treaty body created by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It monitors the human rights obligations of the states that have ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, and every once in a while it issues what's called a general comment, which is a statement of principles of interpretation of various provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Pol Political Rights. Way back in the 1980s, when it, had, it, it only started operating in 1977, and in the early 1980s, it issued a brief general comment on the right to life, Article 6 of the Covenant, that talked about how nuclear weapons were a violation of the right to life. And that has long been kind of overlooked or forgotten over the years, but it's never returned to it. And the work of the Human Rights Committee on the right to life has always focused on issues where the state is threatening to take, is either threatening the life of its own citizens, the death penalty, for example, or where the state is negligent in enforcing or protecting the right to life of its citizens. But in the general comment that was issued in 2018 by the Human Rights Council, the Human Rights Committee, the final paragraph spoke about aggression. And it said, Aggression, a war of aggression is ipso facto a violation of the right to life when people are killed as a result of a war of aggression. And that paragraph has been sort of bubbling up in different places in a recent report, the second report that was issued by the uh, Moscow Mechanism Committee of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. You understand the Moscow mechanism dates back uh, 30 years. It's just the name. It's because it was developed in Moscow and it has nothing to do with Russia. But the Moscow mechanism, they've had two reports and the second one referred to this paragraph saying that this is a violation that any deaths, even of soldiers, this is interesting, even combatants, because they're not invading another country. Their right to life is important as well. Humanitarian law would say, you're a soldier take your chances, you lose your life, that's part of the deal. If you, don't, if you want to be a civilian, take off your uniform and protect your life. But the Human Rights Committee said, any killing is a violation of the right to life, and that means even combatants, to me this makes perfect sense, it makes perfect sense that even combatants have a right to the protection of their right to life if they're the defense forces and they don't cross the border, it seems to me they're entitled not to be killed as well. So this is, this is a, a contribution, and we've seen a few reflections of this elsewhere. One of the interesting changes was that one of the big human rights organizations, Amnesty International, has switched its view on aggressive war. In its first statement, Amnesty, in their first statements, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, 25th of February of 2022, condemned the war crimes that were being committed, said this is a terrible war, and we warned both sides, watch it. Respect the law, don't kill people unnecessarily, et cetera, et cetera. But three days later, Amnesty International issued another statement, and it condemned the invasion as an act of aggression. It created some turmoil, it's still, there's still turmoil, inside Amnesty International about this, but I think it also is a sign of this uh, development, of this direction of travel in international human rights law, which is important and significant. What about the crime of aggression? Now, the crime of aggression, which was prosecuted at Nuremberg under the label Crimes Against Peace, which was described by the judges in the judgment as the supreme international crime but it's had a, an uneven history since then. It was recognized as a supreme international crime 
but it's not always treated that way. Just to give you a minor example, the criminal code of Ukraine, Article 437, I think, makes the waging of aggressive war a violation of the criminal code. Maximum sentence, 15 years. The next article, 438, violating the laws and customs of war, maximum sentence, life imprisonment. Does that make sense? That a, a war crime is more serious than the crime of aggression? Well, I suppose they inherited this from the Soviet Union. Maybe that's the explanation. I'm not sure. But, uh, but it, it, it doesn't jive with the suggestion that aggression is the supreme international crime. And we've seen the same problem uh, in the codification of aggression for the International Criminal Court. But before I say a few words about that, I, I just want to mention uh, an issue I've had with the definition of aggression and the, what we've inherited from Nuremberg and now in the International Criminal Court statute. You can read this yourself, Article 8 bis of the Rome Statute. It limits the prosecution of the crime of aggression to persons in a position to direct the aggressive war of the state. It's called a leadership crime. And it says they're the only people who can be prosecuted for the crime the leaders who are in a position to decide the policy. So it's pretty narrow. It may get to a few of the people we'd like to see prosecuted, but we're only talking about a handful of people who can be prosecuted for this crime. I don't get it, personally. We say the exact opposite when we talk about crimes against humanity and genocide and war crimes. Article 33 of the Rome Statute says Superior orders is not a defense. Of course, we said the same thing at Nuremberg. This has been the rule, really, since the Leipzig trials. Uh, the defendants in Kharkov, in December of 1943, invoked superior orders. They said, we were just doing what we were ordered to do. Guilty. And they hanged them two days later. So this is, it's clear for war crimes. And it's clear for crimes against humanity and genocide. But for aggression, the supreme crime, superior orders is the best defense. Because if you were ordered to commit it, then you could not have been in a position to develop the policy. Obviously, it's the best defense. And I don't get it. People used to say, when, when I would make this argument, they say, it's asking too much of the poor soldier to know whether it's an aggressive war or not. Really? Do we believe that? The whole world looks at what's happened in Ukraine and says, that's a war of aggression. The whole world looks at it and we say, it's a war, it's a war of aggression. The soldiers, can't we hold them to that as well and say, it's a war of aggression, you shouldn't fight. They'll say, but I'm going to be punished. Well, that's what you have to do because if they would do that, then we might not have a war. We might not or we'd have a lot more of them who are deserting and, and are refusing to fight. So I'd like to see that change made. I'd like to see a little more debate about it and the logic behind it, because I don't, I don't get it. I don't think it makes sense. It's well understood that the International Criminal Court can prosecute crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide, Article 6, 7, and 8 of the Rome Statute. I think it's also well understood that it can't prosecute the crime of aggression. The court can prosecute aggression. It's part of the jurisdiction. The amendments were adopted 12 years ago, 13, 12 and a half years ago at the Kampala conference. I attended that conference from beginning to end. I watched all the negotiations. But what we have in the Rome Statute is a bizarre, complex package that makes the provisions for prosecuting aggression completely unworkable. Why is that? Well, what we've done is made a rule that, that makes it impossible to prosecute in Ukraine. The general rule for the International Criminal Court is that you can prosecute a crime that's committed on your territory or by your citizens. But the important part is on your own territory, which you can do anyway. You know, we all have that right to prosecute in our countries, to prosecute crimes committed 
on our territory. What state doesn't do that? But you can't do that with aggression, at least not before the International Criminal Court. You can give the International Criminal Court jurisdiction over war crimes and crimes against humanity, but not aggression. It says it in the Rome Statute. It didn't have to say that, but it makes that rule. It says it can, it can only be prosecuted at the Rome Statute if it's committed by a state party to the Rome Statute, and furthermore, according to the prevailing interpretation, if that state party has ratified the amendments. Well, that doesn't protect you against very much. And I have to tell you, there are only 44 countries that have ratified those amendments. And some of them are really scary military powers, like Andorra and San Marino and Liechtenstein and so on. All of the countries we're worried about, they're clear. They're in the clear. And this is, so this is the, the problem with the Rome Statute, but it could be fixed. And the reason why we have it, I have to say it as well, uh, the, the, the general rule, protecting your territory, at that conference in Kampala where this was adopted, 90% of the countries there, certainly all the countries from the south, would have been very much in favor of the same rule that we have for genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. They would have been in favor. And it was blocked by the two members of the court that are permanent members of the Security Council, Britain and France, and by countries that are friendly to them and allied with them. And uh, they wanted to, they wanted to, in the record of the, of the, of the uh, conference published, it's on the website, the official record, we even have a statement by France at the end of the conference saying, we don't think you can ever prosecute the crime of aggression except with the agreement of the United Nations Security Council. That's France, 2010. And there's a little footnote, there's an asterisk to a footnote that says the United States agrees with this. And the British ambassador had said the same thing during the conference, and it's also in earlier records. So it, this is the source of the problems, but it could be fixed. And maybe this is an occasion to start talking about fixing it. But instead, we're having this debate about creating an ad hoc tribunal. Uh, I'm not convinced that that's the best solution. I know that Ukraine is very committed to it and they're campaigning very hard for it, but I, I'm not convinced that this is the, the right way to go. There was a report that was done by two Belgian experts for the European Parliament, about th came out about three weeks ago. And it has been picked up since then. I mean, it was the, in a way the basis of the resolution of the European Parliament of two weeks ago, calling for a tribunal, but not specifying exactly how that would be created. There's no clarity about how to do this. And in the report by the Belgians, they went through all the different precedents and all the different possibilities, and they found problems with all of them, all of them. And I, I think they were right. They pointed to, there is no precedent for what's being considered. Um, and they explained it all. You can read their report. They came up with one decision, which is a bit of, one, one proposal. This was their innovation. But I think it's a bit of a crackpot innovation, really. It doesn't make sense to me. They said, actually, what we could do, this was their contribution. They said, we could have the General Assembly refer the case to the, to the International Criminal Court because, as I, I should say, the rules about the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, the general rules don't apply if it's the Security Council. So the Security Council could today vote to give the International Criminal Court jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. It's all set up. They could do it, but you know the problem with getting a vote in the Security Council. That can't happen, obviously. So they said, well, we'll, take, we'll be inspired by the Uniting for Peace resolution and we'll have the General Assembly refer it. But this is not a solution because it's not, the, the general, neither the General Assembly or the Security Council can change the law of the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court has its own law. And it doesn't say anything about the General Assembly referring a situation. They could have done that. They could have put that into the Rome Statute, but it's not there. I, it, it's not workable. So my thesis is that we're, all of these things have 
obstacles. So does the ICC, but it has an obstacle that can be, that can be repaired. I wish we were devoting more attention to doing that. It could even be retroactive. If we could fix the Rome Statute, it can apply retroactively. At least it can apply to the entry into force of the amendments on aggression, which are, depending on how you count it, 2013 or 2018 or maybe 2017, but certainly 2022, no problem. Uh, and it will be politically challenging, but it's, it's more elegant as a legal solution. It's, it's already recognized. The issues of immunity have been addressed. There's a judgment of the appeals chamber of the International Criminal Court that says there's no immunity even for the head of state of a non-party uh, non state. So this is my thought about it. And as you can see, I've mentioned some other issues, uh, bombardment of urban centers, um, the uh, question of the participation in the crime of aggression, and the structure of the International Criminal Court, these progressive developments in international criminal law that can come out of this crisis as well. And I think that that's, that's my hope, that this is what's going to come of this. Well, thank you very much. First, I wanted to thank organizers for inviting me. And now I will briefly try to comment Professor Shabas, which is a complex issue because he actually undertook all the subjects in relating to international criminal law. Uh, but I have some, some um, let's say, considerations. Uh, I think that genocide became some kind of metaphor because, as you mentioned at the beginning of your speech, um, there is such a tendency to, um, to say a tribunal on, on war crimes in the meaning that it will be the tribunal to prosecute all the crimes in the world. And actually the same is with genocide, but we always refer to genocide in the meaning of the most serious crimes that happened. Just when the Russian invasion started in February, media started to, to call uh, legal professionals in Poland, including me, to ask whether it is already a genocide. And day by day, they were calling again, asking, is this already a genocide, those crimes happening in Ukraine? And of course, maybe it is a genocide, but we need a court to prove the genocidal intent and to say, yes, this is the genocide. But actually, taking into account all those proofs that were gathered, and it is very complex issue, as Professor Shabas said, but instead we prefer to call everything a genocide, because this genocide, it became a metaphor of every kind of core crime in the world. My second thought is, um, it, 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 and I will refer to those, uh, to those, um, to this um, uh, proposal of yours that maybe the, bo the bombardment of centers um, should be a war crime. This, this prohibition should be a, a war crime. Uh, when when this invasion uh, started. Uh, I thought that we actually have all our, all our military targets in the centers of the city. Of course, in Warsaw, for example, or here in Berlin, we have all ministries in the center of the cities. These are legal targets. How can we be so stupid, you know, to place such dangerous buildings in the centers of the city? Aren't we prepared? Are we are we prepared for all those casualties that will that will be here? You know, for all those victims which will be killed because uh, because some aggressor will tend to bomb all the ministries. Are we ready for those victim, victims? For those civil victims? Uh, so this was um, this was my thought about this bombing um, bombing of the centers. That we are we are very short sighted. 
and we actually, it's, it's probably because we did not, we were not thinking, we as international community, we, we as uh, governments, we were probably not thinking that uh, classical war will ever happen again. We thought, yeah, you know, I was talking to my students, we will, not be, we will not have a classic war again, you know. It will be probably some kind of hybrid conflict, but it will not be a classic war. And here we are, two years later, and we have a classic war with bombings, with tanks, with all the cruel things that are going, that are taking place in a war, including bombing the centers of the cities. And if we are close to, um, close to, if we are talking about the definitions of the crimes and what should be also prohibited during the war, my thoughts were going also in the direction of the cultural genocide. You, you did not mention this. I, I, I would be grateful if you could, you could develop this question because of course this discussion did not start, um, did not start now. It, it, it is a discussion about boarding schools in Canada and boarding schools in Australia and Rohingya culture. And now the Ukrainian culture, which is bombed, which is, which is, which is destroyed. So I think it's definitely the right moment to follow with discussion on cultural genocide and on improvement of the definition from the convention. But of course, <laughs> I know the reality and how it looks with, um, with making a new definition or with making a new convention and how to improve the international law. And this amendment of Rome Statute with Aggression and War Crimes is, is just a classic example of how international community can make a good, uh, a good solution. So, uh, so when this invasion started, um, when this full-scale invasion started, uh, we renewed our attention for accountability for serious international crimes, and a lot of attention, a lot of hope was put on the actions of International Criminal Court. Uh, but we have to mention, and it was, it was already um, said by Professor Shabas, that the um, jurisdiction of ICC is very limited. And it's not limited only because of this material jurisdiction and this unwillingness, for example, to prosecute the crime of aggression, but it is also limited because of financial resources. I don't know if you know that International Criminal Court can prosecute like two or three persons a year, not thousands of people. We are talking about two or three people maybe a year. So definitely it's not a tool to, um, to um, support the international criminal justice universally. We still have to pay our attention and focus on national jurisdictions. So um, that's why it is so important to support national, ju national jurisdictions, not only the Ukrainian one. We all own it to international criminal justice and Poland and Germany and Lithuania and Latvia, they all should undertake their own criminal trials and just prosecute um, the criminals of, of, this, of this war. Um, let me also mention about some, um, some international activities that, are, that actually have been undertaken in context of this, of this conflict, because this discussion cannot be focused only on the International Criminal Court and, uh, and national jurisdictions, but also should include generally international community. And for example, uh, we should maybe press the General Assembly of United Nations to undertake some important initiatives. Also, we have to mention the European Union, which within uh, the Eurojust uh, started with joint investigation team, which includes Poland and Lithuania and Ukraine and Estonia, etc. Also, I have to mention the Genocide Network, which is actually still supporting this idea of international criminal justice. But also European Parliament 
adopted uh, the resolution a few days ago calling on the establishment of special tribunal. And this was supported by the par Parliamentary Assembly of, um, of um, uh, European uh, Council. So all this mobilization, you know, this mobilization around Ukraine is needed and it actually demonstrates that international community is focused uh, on the accountability of, um, of international crimes or on, for serious crimes. But uh, in a way, we just have to support this international criminal justice also. And uh, for example, uh, international uh, prosecutor of international criminal court, he called for financial support, for, for more financial resources so he could follow with the investigation in context of Ukraine. And Assembly of State Parties in December, they decided to increase those financial, uh, those financial, uh, financial resources a little bit, but still, it is not a case, you know, to conduct a lot of uh, international investigations. Uh, so I must tell you I'm a great admirer of, uh, admirer of uh, national jurisdictions and I would like every European uh, state just to commence their own um, prosecutions of, uh, of, wars, of war criminals from Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the lecture and comment that gave us a great summary and overview of our these debates and developments uh, we experienced in, in the last year on the international and more regional national level. Now it's time for Professor Shabas to answer to Professor Wierczyńska's uh, comments and then we'll, be, we'll have like 10 minutes for Q&A session. So if any would like, uh, anyone would like to ask, please prepare your questions. Okay. Well, I, I won't prolong this because I, I, wanna, I don't want to intrude on the question period. Uh, Carolina, you, just, you really asked me about cultural genocide. I said I'd left that out. Um, you know, I think that most acts that we think of as cultural genocide are also very adequately addressed as war crimes or crimes against humanity. So I, I don't know that that's such a decisive um, distinction. That's all I would say. But... Absolutely, the cultural aspects of the, of the conflict are very important, the theft of, of cultural property and the destruction of cultural property. But this is all, you know, covered by the law of, of war crimes, I think. Um, and we agree about domestic courts. I think we entirely agree. I'm known as being, you know, a great enthusiast for the International Criminal Court, which I am, but like you, I'm painfully aware of its great limitations disappointed in a way with its performance over the last 20 years and um, do think, I, I wish that Karim Khan, the prosecutor, instead of asking for more resources for himself, he said, don't give it to me, give it to the Ukrainians. That's what he should be doing. If, if, I, could, if I could comment on, the, on this uh, gen cultural genocide, for many years I thought that you know, all those provi international provisions are enough. Um, because we always try to, um, tr for example, um, uh, the court, uh, international court for former Yugoslavia, in Pavle Strugar case, thought that um, uh, to prove the genocidal intent uh, indirectly, um, we could take into account the destruction of um, cultural heritage. And it was okay, you know, to prove the genocidal intent, so indirectly we used some, uh, some uh, destruction of historical monuments. Um, but later it came to my mind, but why should we treat it as some indirect evidence? For, for me, destruction of cultural places could be direct evidence, direct intent, you know. If you if you destroy the bridge in Mostar, you actually want to commit the cultural genocide. If you kill the tribe like Rwanda and you kill the majority of this tribe, 
you actually commit the cultural genocide. Besides, you know, the physical genocide or, or psychical genocide, biological genocide, you just commit the cultural genocide. It, it was my idea that maybe we should focus on historical objects as of also the victims, you know, if I could say so, uh, some kind of person, personification of the object, but, but maybe if we try to give the legal rights to rivers or to seas, maybe we should also um, develop a little bit the subjects of, with, with legal rights. And I mean, the cultural objects could be also in this group. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> You know, I, I, I think we agree. I, I don't have any problem with using the term cultural genocide, although I have to give a product warning that it's not covered by the Genocide Convention. Yeah, and I also have no problem saying that it would be desirable to amend the Genocide Convention so that it would cover cultural genocide. But if you think some of my ideas are, are, are romantic uh, dreams, uh, that's really the ultimate <laughs> that that would ever happen. Speaking of amending, maybe not genocide convention, because it's like a topic for another lecture, but uh, amending uh, or fixing the problem you have discussed in your lecture, so this lacking uh, jurisdiction of the ICC over the crime of aggression, what would be the solution? The solution is we require a couple of little amendments to the amendments that were adopted last uh, in, in 2010. And then we have to get seven-eighths of them, probably, we have to get seven-eighths of the states that are parties to the Rome Statute to agree. So that's the hard part. What is the time perspective for this process? Well, if they're determined to do it, they can do it quickly. Everything can move quickly if there's a determination to, to change it. But there's no campaign for fixing this problem by amending the Rome Statute. We just have to change. And it's partly because the, the, the elements who want to, want to the, the, the countries, many, some countries, some, not many, would like to keep the Rome Statute the way it is. That is totally inert when it comes to dealing with aggression. So there's resistance to doing that. But there are consequences on the other side. If, if, if the European Union and European states can create an ad hoc tribunal to prosecute the, um, the head of state of a non-member country, that creates a precedent that's interesting because it would mean that the African Union could create a court too and they could prosecute a non-African head of state and the League of Arab States could create a court and they could prosecute a non-Arab state. I won't speculate who that might be, you know. I mean, that's what happens. Is it? And, and so I think they'll, this is the, this is the, the, this is the complexity of this question. It's, it's not about finding a, a quick fix to deal with Putin, uh, so, but it's about creating precedents that are going to lead in unexpected directions. And the, the smart lawyers in the Quai d'Orsay and in the, in the Whitehall and in Foggy Bottom and all the other ministries are thinking about that, saying if we do this, then what, what precedent will that create? The, the, when the French said at the conference uh, 12 years ago, you cannot prosecute aggression without the approval of the Security Council, that's a clear position, at least. We can disagree with it, we can challenge it, but it's clear. And once they say, well, okay, we can make exceptions. Well, what are the exceptions? You know, it's like the exception to authorizing the use of force to prevent genocide when you're acting in good faith. This is a very difficult notion to apply in practice because everybody, of course, is going to say that they're acting in good faith and the people they don't like are in bad faith. But we can't, you can't have a rules-based world order that, that operates on that basis. We have some questions here. Uh, Mr. Gavin and Marie-Louise Marie Beck. Thank you very much for your lecture, Professor Shabas. Um, in Germany, there has been a professor in international law called uh, Professor Luchterhand. He's emeritus. He, in March, came out with a big study that 
uh, according to his knowledge and the details we know, not all the war that is being fought in on the territory of Ukraine can be called genocide, but uh, Mariupol. And uh, we know this figure from Srebrenica, where it was not all the whole of the war, but a certain place under certain conditions. Um, the arguments he mainly had, I, I remember, was um, uh, the, the acts, the terror acts against civilians. We remember the theater which was being bombed, uh, that there was no possibility for civilians to flee because they closed uh, the corridors, uh, plus, because I know it's the problem of proving the intention that he argued if you take the Russian propaganda in the TVs and so on, and since it's state TVs, uh, actually you can take that for granted as the intention. So he proposed, um, he, he was not that clear that genocide would not fit what is happening in Mariupol. That was in March. The German professor, Professor Tomushat, who has been working on the UN level, has been going along with that. A little more careful than Professor Luchterhan, but uh, he joined him and said, I think the, all the signs of a genocide happen. Um, on the other side in Germany, you have uh, Professor Klaus Kress from Cologne, and he is something like a special envoy for Karim Khan for this ad hoc special tribunal for the war of aggression. If you, it, it's, it would be very interesting to have the two of you meet and sit here and meet and discuss, because he will uh, exactly uh, take the opposite argument and tell you that the ICC path never will happen and has no chance, and if, it, if there shall be a chance to make it fast response, a, a response which will come fast, uh, we must go for the ad hoc tribunal. I have to tell you, I always, I know, I'm shaken back and forth between those two paths, but uh, both of them at the moment seem to have such big obstacles and the problem that the Security Council does not act according to how it should, uh, we really have this huge problem of not creating a special format which then in the end will lack any um, um, will lack any credibility because it's obviously political. And you did not name the, the state Israel, but of course we always know that if Arabian state would come together and make uh, their, uh, <laughs> their verdict on Israel, we would all know that this is of course political and you always have to turn things up, upside down if you want to be on the safe side. Thank you very much. Um, it was very, very interesting and with a real pleasure I was listening about uh, how law is sophisticated. And as I understand, I have one general conclusion that we have a problems with the Rome Treaty, which was not signed by the Russia and by the Ukraine, and I understand it. But, the, but my fundamental question is that even if the international tribunal is able to judge three soldiers per year my general question is how to drag these Russian soldiers from Russia. And because of that, I have one question to all panelists. Do you support to judge perpetrators in absentia? A few of the comments. Um, well, it won't surprise you to know that all, all international law professors don't always agree about everything uh, <laughs> at the same time. You described their good friends of mine, the, the people to whom you referred. Uh, Klaus Kress and I exchanged emails. Every day. <laughs> not, not every day because we're busy, and, but, but recently. And I, I think actually you undersell uh, Klaus's commitment to the ICC route. I think Klaus is very 
uh, committed to the reforming the Rome Statute and to fixing the Rome Statute. Um, uh, but, you know, he's... And he's also become now, uh, he, he, you know, the, the prosecutor is very sly. He recruits people to be his special envoys and representatives, and then they have to become loyal supporters of the organization, you know. I'm not criticizing Klaus about that, but I'm saying, you know, you have to beware about that. Um, and as for genocide, you mentioned, of course, the Israel-Palestine issue. What would we say if Palestine said when they attack Gaza, they're committing genocide of the Palestinians? If Mariupol is genocide, then maybe Gaza City is genocide too when it's attacked. Um, this is the other thing. If, that's, if, if destruction of a city like that is genocide, does it apply to Gaza? Does it apply to Hiroshima? Does it think of other cities? Does it apply to Dresden and Hamburg? Um, well, um, it takes us into a, another conference, I think. Um, the, the interesting question that, uh, that Magdalena, you asked, you asked about in absentia trials, um, the, the ICC has a rule, of course, everything can be amended, but it has a rule that says there's no possibility of in absentia trials. At the um, ad hoc tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda, they had no, they didn't have a strict rule in the same way but there was a resistance to, to doing it. They found a, a way of, of having an in absentia trial without calling it an in absentia trial. And that can happen even at the ICC where they could uh, lay charges against President Putin and get to a stage of what they'd call a confirmation hearing. And that would serve a similar kind of a purpose. Might be, it might be an option, it might be a possibility. I can't remember all the details whether we can make that work. But I'm personally not opposed to in absentia trials, but you know, I come from a legal tradition. I was trained legally in Canada and we don't have in absentia trials. I shouldn't say that. We have in absentia trials, um, but we don't start them in absentia. If, if we start a trial and the accused is there and then you know, we, we release them to go home for the weekend and they don't come back. That happens sometimes. They do a run. And then we continue the trial. So it's possible to do it. Um, and the rules vary from country to country. Uh, and we've had one very, I think, not very effective uh, experiment with international in absentia trials, which is the trial uh, at the Lebanon, the, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, which became a huge, a huge business. It, it gave a lot of jobs to a lot of people who loved the tribunal, maybe for that reason. It must have cost half a billion euro or dollars, I don't remember which one, but a huge amount of money to try five people, three of whom were later found to be dead, I think, while the trial went on. And uh, of course, Nuremberg had a, an absent defendant, Martin Bormann, and I always give that as an example when people say, can you try a dead person? Well, yes, if you have an in absentia trial, and you don't know where they are. And that, we know, was the case with Borman. He was already dead before the trial uh, of the International Military Tribunal took place. Thank you. Uh, this question with Mariupol and genocide. Uh, when I'm talking to my students, I always say what, that in the time when we don't have the direct proof of genocidal intent, we have to act like children. That we take the puzzle and put all the puzzles together. You know, we will take the criminal to the court and then step by step we will try to prove that he had a genocidal intent if in the situation when he never expressed his direct genocidal, genocidal intent. In the situation when he did not say, never, I want to kill all the Ukrainian nation or all the Ukrainians. So in the situation that we have some serious acts, we have to look for this genocidal intent, you know, like step by step, trying to get together all the puzzles. And it will be probably the case for International Criminal Court to prove the genocide. Even if we are aware that there was a genocidal intent, we have to prove it personally to every person we try to prosecute. So it might be a problem even in a situation when we are sure that there was a genocide in Mariupol. Um, 
how to drag those people to the court, it is of course the problem. The ICC does not have its own police forces. It cannot, you know, go to Russia and bring Putin before the tribunal. It's of course um, impossible, but it's possible that we will catch some of those criminals, you know, somewhere in the future. Because nobody, you know, wants to spend all the life sitting in Russia. So we can actually hope for their trips to some other countries, state parties to the International Criminal Court, or some other party like Poland, who is prepared, we, Poland is prepared to prosecute international crimes. We have all uh, provisions in our criminal code. We can just prosecute them, you know. So it's not a problem if we catch him in Poland, if we catch one of those criminals in Poland. Uh, the, same will, the same issue will be if we catch this um, criminal in Poland and just uh, bring him to hack for, for the trial before international tribunal. And the last question, uh, I also don't support um, the prosecutions in absentia, I think. This, our international community, our civilization developed so much that maybe we should not use the trials in absentia anymore, especially that, um, of course, if we are sure of the guilt, it's not a problem, but sometimes we will have doubts in the context of this person standing before the court, and this person will not have any right to, uh, to um, support her defense because this person will be absent so it will not be fair trial at all may i just add a, a, a brief very brief comment about the issue of genocide and proving genocide you're quite right carolina the the, the problem putting together a puzzle to prove the genocidal intent and but that's only half the problem that's the easy part the hard part, when you're trying to do that, putting together these pieces of the puzzle, it's not that you have to prove the existence of the genocidal intent. You have to prove that it's not possible that there was any other intent. You have to, it's, it's like the rule of circumstantial evidence. You, if, you have to be able to rule out any other possible intent. And people think, we find this element, we find these statements, Putin gave a speech, he published that, so that proves genocidal intent, absolutely. But could there have been, a, is, that, is that the only possibility? Because we, we don't convict people on a balance of probabilities because it's probably genocidal. You have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's what's proven to be the great difficulty. That's why the International Court of Justice, in two cases, the, 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 the one filed against Serbia by Bosnia and the one filed against Serbia by Croatia has has dismissed the the claim that, that they they were responsible for committing genocide because they couldn't rule out other explanations for their conduct in the war. That's the hard hard part. And, and those Russians leaving Ukraine with all those um, machines, cars, and uh, washing machines, the, the, it it prove it is a proof of their financial motive, for example, not necessarily the genocidal intent. Okay, we have time for one quick question. Uh, which of our guests were with the first? So please ask two very quick questions and direct. Thank you. Well, each thank of you, you has one. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Professor Shabas. My name is Oksana Sinatrova. I'm actually from Kharkiv, uh, Ukraine. You uh, mentioned recent achievements concerning uh, the, the shift of uh, um, aggression and uh, considering it in the light of international human rights law and considering uh, aggression as violation of the right to life. And uh, let me, I'm of course not opposite to this uh, shift to human-centric approach to, to, to this interpretation of aggression. But uh, if we put this idea into the dimension of reparations, and should we consider Russian combatants, Russian soldiers, as victims of aggression, who can 
receive compensation being a victims of aggression? Should we interpret this interplay between use ad bellum and human rights law in this regard? Neglecting use ad bellum and like considering only um, human rights law, the right to life and paying compensation to Russian soldiers, let's say in uh, International Criminal Court, considering them as victims of the crime of aggression, or any ad hoc compensation mechanism. Should they be considered as victims of the crime of aggression and having the right to reparations? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And also one question to Professor Shabas. Uh, Professor Shabas, where do you see the prevention of genocide in the context of Russia's war against Ukraine? And hasn't this concept inherent in the Genocide Convention and in the Rome Statute and in the crime of incitement to genocide, has the concept of prevention been neglected, been a collateral damage, essentially that we have to prove now the existence of genocide and we have to have these atrocities? and we don't really work with prevention. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll try to answer this briefly. I'm not sure I really understand the point about reparations for Russian soldiers. You mean the soldiers who are ordered, conscripted, volunteered to go and fight for Russia would be entitled to reparations? Well, I, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't see the legal basis for that. Um, they have a right to conscientious objection. That's protected by human rights law. They could invoke that as well. Um, but I, you know, I, I, beyond that, I, I, I don't think I have anything useful to say on that point. Um, the other point about the prevention of genocide, of course, the Convention on Genocide uh, is entitled the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. It doesn't say very much about the prevention of genocide, except that states are required to do it. It's mainly about the punishment of genocide. So this is the un, you know, the, the part that we have to read into the convention. And uh, part of how that's been, uh, how that's played out is in things like the doctrine of the responsibility to protect, which was developed within the United Nations. Um, the, you know, the difficulty really is that the, the, the genocide is the most extreme, think of it as the most extreme form of racial discrimination. It's an attack on a group based on religion, race, ethnicity. Um, and uh, it's preceded by all other forms of racial discrimination, which we also have to prevent. And so to me, this is the, this is the difficulty. The debate that we'll have, we may have, at the International Court of Justice in the current case is about whether um, the obligation to prevent genocide uh, supersedes the prohibition on the use of force. I don't see how that can be derived from the convention. Though. That would have to be derived from customary law because the Genocide Convention is a UN treaty. It has to be interpreted in a manner consistent with the Charter of the United Nations. And um, if, it, if it's inconsistent, the, the treaty or at least the provision is void anyway. So I don't see that coming from the, from the convention. But I, I think there's more to be developed on the prevention of genocide. But most of the writing about it, ultimately, when you read the stuff that, for example, the special advisor on the prevention of genocide has produced, um, is about preventing forms of racial discrimination. We should do that. That's the, that's, to me, that's the heart of the prevention of genocide, is preventing all of the, you know, all of the, 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 the things that contribute to it. And, and stopping them before they happen. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shabas, Professor Wierczyńska. I'm really sorry to cut this discussion, but that's the reality of our conference schedule. Thank you very much for attending this uh, conference for all questions and panels. Uh, I think our guest deserves. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs>